Last week, we looked at the promise, the protevangelium, the promise, the first promise, the first gospel in Genesis 3, 15, that the offspring of the woman, the male child of the woman, would crush the head of the serpent, would do combat, and in, uh, in the combat, he himself would die. And then we saw um, our first mother's mistaken identity of her son, uh, she has gotten a man, Yahweh, uh, and, uh, but this, this son is not, in fact, the Redeemer, just the opposite. Uh, he's the first murderer, uh, so we have to go farther. Now we get to uh, the prophecy of Emmanuel, and it's particularly important that we know this on account of the name of our church. Our church is named uh, after this great confession of the two natures in Christ, this title of uh, of uh, the son of the virgin. And so it comes from Isaiah 7, verse 14, uh, given there for you in uh, bold red. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, but we need to understand the context of this. So to do that, we have to go to the beginning of Isaiah chapter 7, there at verse 1. Let's just work our way through that then. Isaiah chapter 7, Verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Razin, Rezin, Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. So Ahaz uh, is the, uh, the king of Judah. And this is after, uh, the, after the divided kingdom. This, this can get very confusing uh, until, you, uh, until you grasp it, because you might think Israel, and you would naturally think, uh, you, know, you might think Jerusalem, and you think Israel. And the entire world. There's no sense crying over spilled coffee. There's also no crying in baseball. Um, the, um, um, divided kingdom, yes. Um, so Judah is the southern kingdom of Jerusalem. And it's named after the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah, together with the Levites, were uh, uh, remained, uh, remained faithful, and the, uh, then the northern kingdom uh, was called Israel at this point. So you've got the king of Israel making war against the king of Judah. Uh, so the divided kingdom is, at, is not just divided uh, politically or geographically, but, uh, but in fact at war with each other. Um, and the king of Israel uh, is joined by the king of Syria. So these two kings have come uh, to make war uh, against Judah uh, and against Jerusalem. They're laying siege, but, uh, but at this point, it's a, it's a stalemate or a standoff. Uh, so they're laying siege, but, um, uh, but he hasn't, they haven't been able to conquer uh, Jerusalem. And we learn in verse 2 then uh, what the state of, um, uh, of things is in Judah. And it was told to the house of David, that would mean uh, to Ahaz, uh, to the kingly line. So it was told then in the, in the court. News came, to the, news came to the court, news came to the royal house, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his, that is Ahaz's heart, and the heart of his people were moved. And this doesn't mean uh, you know, stirred by uh, a rousing uh, rendition of Silent Night in German or something like that. It's not rousing, but sentimental and contemplative. But rather, they were moved to terror, is the idea here. Uh, they're disturbed, they're terrified. As the trees of the woods are moved with the wind, so they are shaking, if you will. They're, they're shaking in their boots uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem uh, at, uh, at what is coming. But you can imagine how this might be if we had an invading army uh, set up, uh, you know, set up camp uh, just outside the city. That would make us nervous too. Uh, so they're they're terrified, and the Lord sends Isaiah to this son of David. You have to keep that in mind. This is the son of David. 
David, a man after God's own heart. David, the one whom uh, the Lord loves. David, uh, the one who is the bearer of the promise. The promise has come now all the way down to David and to David's household uh, regarding the seed and, and the Messiah. Uh, and so verses 3 and following is intended to bring comfort and consolation to the house of David. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Sher, Joshua, your, Joshua, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool, on the highway to the fuller's field. They're very precise instructions. And say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Razin and Syria and the son of Ramalia. Don't worry about them. Uh, they're smoking firebrands. The idea is, they, it appears that there's all this uh, activity, the smoke being given off, but in fact, they're about to be extinguished. They're about to be put out. Don't worry about it. All is well. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have plotted evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tebel. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is seen within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son. If you will not believe, surely you will not be established. So, you need to believe this, my message. I'm going to take care of you. It's going to be okay. Do not fear. Do not worry. Shake no more, but stand still and be quiet. It's all, it's all taken care of. Uh, but uh, Ahaz, uh, well, we'll see how, how Ahaz responds. The Lord does something particularly gracious. I mean, sometimes we're prone to wanting to ask God for a sign, but how often do you get the opportunity where a prophet appears to you and says, God not only gives you his word, but he will give you a sign. Name it. Name what you want. Uh, you know, think of whatever crazy, spectacular thing you can imagine, um, and, and I will do it, so that you can know that this message is true. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, verse 10, saying, 11, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. In other words, a sign up in the heavens, in the stars and the, and the planets, uh, or ask it you know, from the depths of hell, from Sheol. Ask whatever you want and it will be accomplished. And Ahaz, it sounds so pious, it sounds so nice. I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Uh, so, but and that sounds very pious. You're not supposed to put the Lord your God to the test. That's actually in the Bible. Uh, but it's okay if he says, put me to the test. Give me a sign uh, that, that you want me to perform for you. So he's been given an explicit instruction, and he, and he rejects it. Uh, so this is not good. And so it is not going to come to pass for Ahaz as he wished for it to be. Uh, therefore, the, uh, it will not uh, come to pass. They, they will be uh, defeated. Uh, then he said, with a note of impatience, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, there's a little bit more to it than, uh, than that, but we'll leave that off for a moment. So God himself gives a sign. Uh, but now the, the parameters have changed. The situation has changed. Uh, and it is to us now to figure out what is meant by this. And there are two critical words here. Uh, the first is virgin, or the Hebrew that lies behind it. And then the second is Emmanuel. Uh, so the first deals with the nature of the sign. Uh, the second deals with the content and what there might be uh, for that. Well, uh, it's kind of maybe a sign with, uh, with two edges. Before we talk about uh, virginity uh, and the nature of the Hebrew term, uh, is it a good thing if God is with you? <coughs> Anybody want to disagree? <laughs> well, I will. Well, I will. Yeah? So Adam and Eve, after they had 
sin, they didn't think it was good. That they didn't think it was good at all. They were trying to hide. Right. Right. Yeah. Precisely. So it's a it's only a good thing dependent upon how God is exposed <laughs> towards you. Uh, so uh, God with you is not the same as God for you. So it's not necessarily a good thing. It all depends on what his disposition is, his attitude is, his demeanor is uh, towards them. Remember when Jesus shows up in the house, uh, the upper room, on Easter evening? How did the disciples react? Fear. Terror, yeah. He's coming to judge us. He's coming to condemn us, to rebuke us. That's what they thought. So Jesus twice has to say, peace be with you. Uh, so, Emmanuel, God with us, may be a good thing. It may not be a good thing. It all depends on what his disposition is. So, uh, we should see gospel in this passage, but, uh, but not necessarily. It really depends on, uh, on, on who you are. Well, more on that in a little bit. Uh, but let's uh, consider uh, this. And the reason why I'm going into this um, it's not because I think y'all need to learn Hebrew. Um, I get an upgrade from Leo back there when I throw some Greek terms in there. But because um, you, uh, if you if you come across sort of um, um, anti-biblical apologists, um, and these would be you know chiefly liberal Bible scholars, um, you're going to have your uh, your faith cast into doubt and despair, because somebody with the seeming veneer uh, of scholarship behind them, and I'm not saying these people are dumb, they're not, uh, but people will try to make a scholarly argument against this Bible passage, meaning what you have been taught that it means. So uh, so I want you to learn the, the depths of this, that you may come to a better understanding and confession of what's going on. Uh, the Hebrew term is alma. That's the word that is being uh, used here. Um, Let's just write this up on the board. That is the Hebrew word that is that is being used here. It's not the only word that could be used. And the liberal scholar will say that doesn't mean virgin. Now, uh, if we were to look it up uh, in uh, in, in, a, in a significant lexicon, a standard lexicon, the halot there, H-A-L-O-T, stands for Hebrew and Aramaic Lexicon of the Old Testament. Uh, this is the authoritative lexicon uh, for Biblical Hebrew. There's another significant one called BDB, Brown Driver Briggs, uh, which is also significant, uh, but it's not as uh, standard. Uh, uh, it's, it's a standard, but it's, it's not, you know, kind of the number one authority. Uh, and uh, the halon will define it as marriageable girl, and then note what I put after that, until the birth of a child. Uh, that's how they will uh, define it. Um, they, uh, what comes before that, T-W-O-T, it stands for Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. Uh, they give us the primary or first meaning, young woman. And the, note then the, uh, what the TWOT says regarding the definition marriageable girl until the birth of a child. The latter statement, that is until the birth of a child, is purely conjectural. But there is no evidence on which to base it. So our real question is what, what was intended uh, by this meaning? There, there is another term that can be used principally for, uh, for virginity. There we're, we're not dealing with, if you will, the whole person or the whole condition of the person. If we're speaking about a marriageable girl, we're not just talking about her virginity, but also her age and her gender and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, why this word and not the other word? Uh, let's uh, move into the next, uh, the next section, elaboration. Uh, from the, the article in the Theological Word Book on the Old Testament, uh, since Bethula, which is uh, the other word that could have been used, since that word, Bethula, is used many times in the Old Testament as a specific word for virgin, it seems reasonable to consider that the feminine form of this word is not a technical word for a virgin, but represents a young woman, one of whose characteristics is virginity. 
This is borne out by the fact that the, now LXX, those are, it's Roman numerals for 70, and this stands for the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And the Septuagint is very important uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, because it is the text that many of the New Testament authors were working with. They were, they were, the New Testament being written in Greek, they were working with often the Greek Old Testament. And so it's important to study for that purpose. But it also gives a window into how the Jews, before the time of Christ, understood these Hebrew terms. So, um, the, the Septuagint translates this word, Alma, translated, uh, th this word which could be young woman, uh, it translates it as Parthenos, which means virgin. You see, that's the critical point here. We, we go before the time of Christ, and so before anybody was arguing about this, and we look, how did the Jews understand this particular prophecy, this particular term? They understood Alma as Parthenos, which means virgin. No conjugal relations beforehand. That's, uh, so that's extremely uh, significant. Um, and so, and two times out of seven, that's what they use. And here in Isaiah 7:14, uh, it's quoted by Joseph, or to, rather to Joseph, by the angel as a prediction of the virgin birth. Some translators interpret Matthew 1:22 and 23 as being simply a comment by Matthew. But it is more reasonable to consider that the argument that convinced Joseph was the fact pointed out to him by the angel that such an event had already been predicted by. Isaiah. You remember when Matthew discovered, uh, uh, Matthew, when Joseph discovered that Mary was pregnant, what was he going to do? Divorce her. Divorce her. You know, and uh, you know, I'm sure she's she's got this tale of oh, oh no, Joseph, there wasn't actually a man. There was no man. I saw no man. It was it was an angel. And there was an angel here. And Joseph, no doubt, was thinking, yeah, I'm not that gullible. Uh, so it takes the appearance of the angel to Joseph, and then the quotation, hey, you know what? What's happening here has already been recorded in the prophet Isaiah. <coughs> well then, Joseph does what? Happily goes and marries her and adopts the child and, uh, and becomes father uh, to the child Jesus. Uh, so, uh, so you've got a pretty good argument to be made here uh, that a, the Septuagint renders it Parthenos, virgin, and Joseph seems particularly convinced by this text uh, that, in fact, she, she was a virgin but with child. Uh, the fact that virginity is obvious in Genesis 24, where Alma is used of one who was being sought as a bride uh, for Isaac. So the real point here is that Alma doesn't mean exclusively virgin. Uh, it, it deals with women of a particular age and status, but virginity is one of the characteristics. Uh, and as I think we pointed out later in my study sheet, it's not much of a sign if, if a woman becomes pregnant. That happens all the time. What is a sign is that she becomes pregnant without conjugal relations, without the aid of a man. Does that make sense? Okay, so Alma, Hebrew for young woman, but it can mean virgin. Septuagint, Greek Old Testament, renders it Parthenos, virgin, and that then is used as uh, evidence for, uh, uh, for Joseph uh, in taking uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary as his wife. Now, in uh, the second, uh, I call it second here, it's second and third uh, century, late second, early third century, um, uh, the, the Jews, now you have to keep in mind the context, this is after uh, the coming of the Christ, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and the spread of the gospel after Pentecost, uh, you've got uh, men, Jewish men who are not Christians, who are trying to find a way around this Bible passage. And their theory is that it's Hezekiah. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a nice uh, uh, theory, but uh, 
The problem is that Hezekiah is already born, so it's really not much of a sign. So that's not so good. Now, the more significant theory uh, is this liberal theory that the prophecy is fulfilled by the birth of Isaiah's son, who has this crazy name, Maher Shalal Hashbaz. And they're actually, I'm forgetting what uh, TV show I saw him in, but there actually is um, an actor uh, uh, who is uh, working and active today, whose parents thought it would be a kick to name him this. Um, so, um, uh, so at any rate, um, uh, this name then appears uh, later in the next chapter of Isaiah, in chapter 8, um, and the name means the spoil speeds, the prey hastens. Now, since Isaiah had a son already, we saw that back in verse 3 when the Lord says, hey, you go out to meet Ahaz, here's where I want you to go, and oh, by the way, bring your son with you, and this son, Shear Joshub, a remnant shall return. Uh, since Isaiah already has a son, you have to go through some uh, imaginative uh, exegetical gymnastics here by assuming, okay, Isaiah's wife dies, and so he gets another wife, and she's a virgin when they conceive the child, and that's who we're talking about. Uh, you kind of have to, you, you have to read a lot of uh, extra things into the text that aren't there. Uh, but uh, at any rate, this is a, a significant uh, theory as well. Uh, if we were to have moved on in Isaiah chapter 7 to verse 15, we would see that he will eat curds and honey. Nobody's uh, running to Safeway uh, late at night to pick up some formula uh, for, uh, for the child. He's going to be living off the wild land, uh, not, uh, not the cultivated land. This is not the typical food uh, for a baby. Uh, is it Mrs. Gore? No. Curds and honey? What do you think, Elizabeth Rose? Yeah. She's such a sweet baby. Maybe she'd go along with it. I don't know. But, um, uh, but at any rate, that's the, the alternate theory. And let me give you an example of this. There's a long article in, uh, there's a very good uh, Bible dictionary. If you think that, you might think a you know, smallish book, you know, maybe five or six hundred words, something like that. But it's actually quite a significant a uh, bit of scholarship where there are long articles on various biblical topics. And the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary is very good, but it's also quite liberal uh, in spots, uh, as is the entire um, uh, Anchor Bible Commentary. Uh, very good, very liberal. And uh, here's uh, two, art or two paragraphs from the article on Emmanuel. And you'll uh, see the way this runs. In spite of the diversity of views just referred to, the majority of scholars would, would endorse an interpretation something like the following. So this is the liberal point of view on this text. The young woman referred to is a wife of Ahaz, and the son to be born would be a child of Ahaz. As such, he would be a guarantee to the continuation of the Davidic dynasty, David's kingly line, to which perpetuity had been promised, and from which great things have been expected. For this reason, the symbolic name, with us is God, Emmanuel, could be given to the child. And as the Lord had already promised, the threat from Syria and Israel would dissolve. Nevertheless, because Ahaz had refused to believe and to repose his faith in the Lord alone, the trust he had placed in Assyria would occasion terrible devastation for Judah. This interpretation is messianic and sometimes characterized as dynastic messianism, meaning there's not a single messiah, but the, the entire line is messianic, is saving, salvific, uh, in that the continuation of the dynasty, the continuation of David's kingly line, preserves the channel for the promised blessings and leaves open the possibility of a future individual in whom these blessings will be realized in a unique way. No critical scholar today, and the important thing to understand critical here is not curmudgeonly, um, and, it, uh, and it also doesn't mean super important, but critical means uh, a category of thinking. Uh, and you could, it, it doesn't precisely mean this, but you could substitute here liberal. Uh, I mean, that's, and I don't mean that even in a pejorative way, uh, as opposed to uh, people who tend to believe what the Bible has to say, the critical scholar uh, is, uh, is one who is, uh, is 
poking holes, both with the text and also any kind of uh, miraculous meaning to the text. So a critical scholar in New Testament terms, or in, in uh, studying the New Testament, a critical scholar is certainly not going to believe um, in a virgin birth, in a bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead, is not going to believe in uh, miracles that he has done, that kind of thing. And a critical scholar in the Old Testament is not going to believe, say, in a worldwide flood. Uh, such as is recorded in uh, Genesis 7. You, uh, and so that's, uh, that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with. And perhaps the critical scholars in the Old Testament are uh, best known for what's called a four-source theory for the Pentateuch. Uh, that is to say, uh, the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are not written by Moses or by a single Auditor, uh, author slash editor, but rather there are four different sources. This is called the JEDP theory. J for, the, for Jehovah or Yahweh. E for the Elohist, Elohim. Um, P is for priestly, the Levitical stuff, the uh, sacramental ceremonial stuff. And then D is for the Deuteronomist, uh, sort of the, the second editor to go back through it. Um, and they'll go through that and try and find these four strands throughout. You know, you're, you can make an entire career of studying Hebrew and trying to piece together, well, that word is from the Eloist, and oh, that little bit there, that's from the priestly writer or writers, that kind of thing. So that's the sort of stuff that they're into. No critical scholar today holds that Isaiah directly foretold the birth of Jesus as a virgin. Now, if you are a kid heading off to college, let's say you're 19, you show up, you show up in class, and you taught a teacher, an authoritative uh, teaching type professor uh, that comes at you with this sort of information. What are you going to say? Or what are you going to think? He's, he's right. This is scholarship. And here he's, he's getting out. Look, here it says in the Hebrew, this word, you, you were taught in Sunday school that the virgin conceives, but oh, there's a, this Hebrew word, it's all a bad translation. It really means young woman. Uh, and uh, no, no Bible scholar actually believes this. Nobody who actually reads the Bible um, in, in Hebrew believes this. That's sort of the, the thrust, that the, the, the implication that's being given uh, by all of this. And so what, what happens to these college kids? They, they doubt, and then they, and then they, they, they disbelieve all again. Right. And the opposite reaction to this is to say all scholarship, all learning is bad, suspicious, and so you retreat into fundamentalism, where there's no kind of critical <coughs> thinking going on, and uh, book learning uh, is seen as a bad thing, as destroying the faith. So this is, this is very dangerous kind of, uh, kind of stuff here. Uh, well, let's continue the argument. First, the sign of Emmanuel was given to Ahaz and his contemporaries as part of Isaiah's message. And an event that occurred some 700 years later would not be relevant to them. In other words, here's this sign. It's not going to be fulfilled for a long time, so it's meaningless. It doesn't have any point. Um, moreover, by his reference to the fate of the land before whose two kings you stand in dread, which is to say Syria and Israel, Isaiah clearly ties Emmanuel to the contemporary scene. Second, the Hebrew term for the young woman refers to a young woman of marriageable age who may normally be supposed to be a virgin, but it's not the technical term for virgin, the uh, which, would have, which would have to have been used if that were the precise point intended. Third, there's also the fact that while a virgin birth may be the object of faith, it is not subject to the kind of observation that would make it a sign in any meaningful sense. And it'd be even better if you had a pipe and uh, some glasses that were a little bit rounder than mine and a nice kind of plaid jacket while you're saying all this. You know, very scholarly, very serious. It's just, oh, you poor child, you were, you were misled by those fundamentalists back home. Um, well, so that's the way the liberal argument runs. This word doesn't mean what you thought that it meant. Uh, we've got to make it make sense for, uh, for Ahaz if it doesn't. Um, and besides, who can believe in all this virgin birth nonsense anyway? So out with that. And what are you left with then? As you strip away not just the virgin birth, but that entire sort of category of thinking, all the, um, 
uh, all the miraculous, all the Old Testament promise fulfilled in Jesus in the New Testament. What are you left with? What? Well, I understand what you mean by nothing, but you don't have the two natures anymore. You certainly don't have the two natures. So what kind of Jesus do you have at this point? A nice man who tells you to do nice things, good things. And so basically what is he? Jesus is an ethics professor. That's what Jesus becomes. It's, yeah, it's, uh, and so good morality becomes then the essence of, and you can see then how somebody like Thomas Jefferson uh, could take his uh, razor blade and trim out the parts of the Bible that are uh, kind of challenging to believe, and then you're just left with Jesus, a nice man, saying nice things about being nice people. Um, and Well, but that ignores, that ignores a lot of the things that Jesus said about himself. Well, of course it did. Yes, of course it did. That's why we need the razor blade, so we can cut some of those out. I mean, I mean, Jesus can't be just a nice guy. He's either the redeemer of the world or a false prophet because yeah. of what he says about himself. Right. He's not. He can never be in the middle. Totally agree. Yeah. Did you get my email about the um, about the uh, uh, baptized in the place of the dead? Uh, no, I haven't read no. it. But, okay. but, I, but, I, but yeah. I've read a lot of the Luther study Bible about it. Good. Yeah. So, they, I, I'll just mention this because we talked about 1 Corinthians 15 in passing last week, and uh, Leo asked about the passage in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, that talks about those who are baptized for the dead. Um, and, of course, the Mormons use this passage uh, to bolster their baptism by proxy uh, practice. But um, uh, the, the two options, in short, are the Corinthians had some sort of aberrant practice, uh, like unto a baptism by proxy, uh, or the argument of uh, the professor who taught me Greek, Greg Lockwood, who wrote the commentary on 1 Corinthians, um, is, it takes it in the, the locative sense, baptized in the place of the dead, that is in the location of the dead, the area of the dead, which is to say a graveyard. And we know that the Christians worshiped in catacombs. You can go visit some of them. If you ever go to Rome, go to the San Calixtus, or Calixtus um, catacombs. Those, those are good ones. Uh, so baptisms, not to think about they would happen there as well. That's, you could, we could spend an hour just yeah. talking about that. So, all right. Were you going to, did you have a question or a comment? I have a question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. In Isaiah 7, 14, when you read that passage, uh, the word son and the word is are both capitalized. Right. Uh, that's, that's an editorial decision being made by, uh, being, being made by those who put together the, in your case, the New King James. Okay. Uh, you don't. We don't have that kind of benefit in the Hebrew text, okay. uh, so that is a that's they're trying to help you uh, grasp what's going on there. But technically speaking, um, I mean, I, I I'm a fan of capitalizing divine pronouns and other divine references. I think that's both pious and helpful for the reader. But it's good to note uh, and to know that that is not uh, something that's actually present in the original text. Um, okay, so uh, some will say, because they want to have a foot in both camps, uh, they'll say, well, there was an immediate fulfillment, and then there was an ultimate fulfillment. Uh, and uh, this runs in the same kind of way uh, as Chaplain Shaw preached about the destruction of Jerusalem and then the second coming when he was here uh, uh, three, four weeks ago. Um, and in that case, uh, I would totally agree uh, with Chaplain Shaw about the idea of a double, uh, a double fulfillment. You remember he used the image of a, uh, of a painting, um, and you have the what's in um, what's in the foreground and what's in the background. And so you have the immediate, and then you have the long range. And that's the way that some would try to uh, take this text as well. Uh, I I'm not persuaded by it, but there are you know good pious Christians who do believe in this double fulfillment kind of thing. Well, I think that the context in Isaiah, uh, particularly in chapter 9, uh, suggests that the Son, spoken of in 714, is still to come. Uh, let's pop over to Isaiah 9 now. And you all know this, um, Handel's Messiah. 
Um, verse 6 is the key thing, but just look at verse 1. Um, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her uh, by the way of the sea uh, beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Uh, those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them a light has shined. Well, what we have here is what some Bible uh, translations will render the latter time. Uh, the New King James puts it afterward. Uh, but there is the now time at first, um, and then there is the latter time, the time which is to come. And it is in this latter time, afterward, later, um, that we will get the, that Isaiah is saying this promise will be fulfilled, promise in verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, so there's a child who is to be born. And again, I would support the capitalizing of child and son here, even though that's not something that is actually going to be part of the text. It's not going to not be part of the text either. It's just they wouldn't do that. Uh, but we can see that there is still a child who is to come in the latter time, in the afterward time. And we also learn something about the identity of this child. What will we call him? God. Mighty God. And we will even call him Father. And this is because while the second person of the Trinity is not the Father, uh, but the Son, the external works of the Trinity are one, are united. Uh, the Son is united with the Father, and we can say that uh, where God acts, the Father is also acting. Uh, Jesus becomes, if you will, a kind of Father to a new humanity. Uh, you could. Uh, um, it would be better to speak of him as brother, but, uh, but Isaiah is not uh, at all uncomfortable giving forth this prophecy uh, that the child who is to be born could even be termed father. Uh, so there is a prophecy yet to come, and uh, that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, it wouldn't be much of a sign, Christensen says, if it's not a virgin who's given birth. Uh, and let's look at the... Uh, uh, at the Bible passage that's fulfilled, Matthew chapter 1. Now, I put it on the, your, um, your third page uh, there. And we have, uh, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child. And there also in the, in the New Testament, in Matthew's uh, Greek New Testament, or in Matthew's Greek Gospel, I should say, that word virgin there is parthenos, same word as is used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament of Isaiah 7.14. The virgin, the Parthenos, shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And then Matthew gives to us the translation of this Hebrew term, which is translated God with us. Uh, now, so that's what Emmanuel means. And this can be spelled with an E uh, as well, leading to tremendous confusion when things are shipped to Emmanuel Episcopal Church versus Emmanuel Lutheran Church, just a block away from each other. One year they had our palms. Cassie and I were in uproar. Where are the palms? Where are the palms? Where are the palms coming? The Episcopalians had our palms. <laughs> um, so uh, they're nice people over there. Uh, what did we get from these? We got a choir once. I'm not kidding. A choir once showed up. And because I'm slow, I mean, I'm just not quick on my feet. What I wish that I had done, even just as a joke, it would have been great, because this choir shows up at the door. Here we are. You know, and I don't know, we, we didn't order a choir. Um, what I should have done is said, the balcony, right up this way. Come right this way. I'm assuming they were going to sing some Thomas Tallis or something and not, you know, nonsense. Um, M is with. And this marker has fallen under my judgment. Um, <laughs> and uh, this means us. In particular, this ooh, uh, us. And 
L is God. Um, the plural of L is Elohim. Uh, so with us, God uh, is, is literally uh, what it means. With us, you could say, is God. Uh, and so God has come to be with us. This child who is born is in fact God with us. That's the meaning uh, of the term. But remember, God with us is not the same as God for us. So we want the God who is with us to also be the God for us. Now, this then becomes the dominant... Oh, that's saying too much. Back it up. This is the frame of the uh, Gospel of Matthew. How does Matthew's Gospel end? Matthew, Matthew's Gospel begins, basically, you've got this genealogy, and then uh, the announcement of the birth, and the birth of Matthew, um, and this promise to Joseph uh, that uh, this child, born of Mary, is God with us. How does the thing end? Go therefore, making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, <coughs> teaching them to observe all such things as I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. I am with you always. I am, ego in me, I am Yahweh, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the bread of life, I am with you always. So Christ is with his church. And I uh, told you before, I don't care, I love it, I'm telling you again. You've heard it a thousand times, you can't hear it enough. I, my mom gave me this awesome cross, and on it is etched uh, a little Lord's Supper scene. Um, in the center of this cross, Jesus with his disciples at table, and it says in German, Ich bin bei euch alle Tage. I am with you all the days. That's the, that, that would be the, the German rendering of this. How is he with us? In his supper. How else is he with us? Matthew chapter 18 teaches us about forgiveness. Peter, how many times should I forgive these wretched fools who keep on sinning? Seven times? No, I say to you, seven times seven. Or seven times seventy. It's hard to know exactly what's going on there. Seventy times seven. Uh, 49, 490. Don't keep track. Keep going. Always forgive. That's the point there. Yes. You have to set aside your mathematical precision and go with Bible math, which says a whole bunch and keep on counting. Or stop counting. Don't count. And then Jesus says, by way of sort of fulfillment of the promise, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So, Emmanuel is the presence of God with his holy church. And he was tangibly present um, in the flesh. He is tangibly present with us in the flesh, though hidden in the sacramental elements of bread and wine, which are the true body and blood of Jesus. God is with us. And he's also with us in the absolution. When we gather together, when I go and I stand before the altar and I say on behalf of all of us, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, uh, the Lord is with us. Wherever two or three are gathered doesn't mean wherever two or three are gathered for baseball or donuts uh, or something like this. But it means in my name, gathered in the worship assembly, Christ is present there with his church. So the promise of Emmanuel uh, is a... Is a fulfilled in Jesus as the promise of grace and absolution uh, and love and communion um, and ultimately in resurrection. What we're going to do next week then is we will see how not the term Emmanuel but the concept of God dwelling with man is the object of the, is the culmination of the Christmas Day Gospel, John chapter 1 verse 14, and how this is the way that the Bible closes in the last couple chapters of Revelation. The last two chapters of Revelation are based upon this promise of the Word, which is made flesh, dwelling in our midst. Or rather, we being brought to dwell in the midst of the Word, where the Word is. So, the beginning of the Bible, 
promise of a seed of the woman who will undo the work of the serpent, who will crush his head, who will rescue mankind from his plight and from his problem. Smack dab in the middle of the Bible, if you open up your Bible in the middle, you'll be in Isaiah, is this promise of God with us, the incarnation, Emmanuel, God come to rescue and redeem his people, promise fulfilled in the incarnation of Jesus. Next week we will look at how this uh, will be fulfilled in an even greater sense, at the end of time, at the end of the age. Uh, so that's where we uh, that's where we are going. There's more information here if you'd like to read through it, just on uh, some uh, patristic comments. And then uh, the last uh, two pages uh, is from the uh, InterVarsity New uh, uh, New Bible Dictionary, which has a very nice uh, article on Emmanuel. You can read through there and then get the the conservative, if you will, rebuttal uh, to the Anchor Bible. Uh, commentary. Uh, so the final lesson then is if, if there's some guy who has PhD after his name who is blathering on about how the Hebrew doesn't really say this and you're all just fools, um, you're not. Believe it. Uh, it is true. And there is a good, solid, scholastic Hebrew way uh, of understanding this text. Um, and so we can actually learn things, um, not just regress into, uh, into anti, uh, anti-scholarship. Uh, but nevertheless believe the promises that are written in Scripture for our comfort. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, send down your Holy Spirit upon us that we may rejoice to be with Christ in his supper, that we may receive his benefits in the holy absolution and be sustained all of this day and this life as we walk through darkness uh, by means of the light which is your word and the light which is Jesus Christ and at last attain unto everlasting light in the resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.